Today, I can't wait to introduce you to Tiff Chang. Tiff, thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm so happy that we're here. Oh, thank you for having me on this podcast. I can't wait to just share knowledge, information, and for us to have an amazing conversation together. I can't wait to get to know you. So you came very, very highly recommended by our common friend, Debbie. By the way, everybody should go and follow Debbie. Go follow her on YouTube. Um, she is How Debbie Saves, saves, and she can help you save a whole ton of money. So Debbie, we love you. <laughs> we love you, Debbie. <laughs> so, also follow her on Instagram too. <laughs> go follow her on Instagram, How Debbie Saves. We're going to put her in the show notes because now she's, yeah. she's a big part <laughs> sure. of why we're here. Um, she's just amazing. So. Tiff, um, why don't we start by you telling us what do you do right now and who do you serve? Yeah, that's a really great question. I definitely think we'll get into my story um, in a little bit as well. But I now um, and am a brand designer and mentor, um, and I specifically help content creators to uh, build an influential brand online so that they can attract um, visibility and paid opportunities to um, their business and their brand. Love it. And um, I like to start way back. And you actually have a story that I believe a lot of people can relate to. Can you share with us um, a little bit of what your story of growing up was like? Tell us, start with where were you born? Yeah, for sure. So I was born in Hong Kong um, and I moved to Canada when I was three. Um, and I think I would say for the first few years of my life, it was like a very kind of like picture perfect life of like, and I'm an only child too. So it was like my mom, my dad, um, and us living in like a nice house, just moved, um, and immigrated to Canada. It's like literally the dream. Um, and when I was 11 years old, my parents actually got a divorce. And so that was kind of like a really big kind of life altering I guess, <laughs> I don't, event <laughs> that happened in my life that kind of shifted and shaped a lot of things um, in my life that kind of really shaped who I am today as well. And um, I'd love to hear more. I feel like I'm, I'm probing, but feel free to elaborate yeah. more. Um, where your, the family friend was actually even, I would call it verbally, abusive to you. Mm -hmm. I mean, can you, if you, if you wouldn't mind, if you would let yeah. us go into that part, because I really feel like there's, there's room for everybody who's listening, who has felt, um, you know, not just unsupported, but really taken down in their early lives and how, you know, there are repercussions to us living in that environment and feeling that environment when we are young later on in life and how it trickles, it, it trickles into everything that we do. So uh, if you wouldn't mind sharing with us, what that was like, um, and if you believe that it has informed or shaped you in adulthood. Yeah, absolutely. So the first family friend that I um, lived with, she was actually great. We're still like family friends to this day, but it was when my parents got divorced and my mom actually had to find another place for us to stay because we were selling the house and my parents were trying to figure all that stuff out. So we then stayed with a family friend and they had an entire family and they thought that their child was super, super smart, had, you know, their shit together. And they just kind of like put her on a pedestal. And I felt like I was very dismissed all of the time. And they actually sometimes would call me stupid or like not very smart in front of my mom. And it's like, I'm like 11 years old. Right. And so I feel like just that experience of living with a family that always put their child on a pedestal and me always feeling very inferior. I think it has really shaped me to, I don't know if this is a good thing, but I've always had this mindset of like needing to prove myself and like having a certain mindset of, you know, striving for perfection and like, kind of like being the best um, of the best because I was looked down on when I was younger, which is definitely not a great feeling to feel when you're <laughs> 11 years old. Yeah. And it, it actually made you even work harder once you got into high school. So tell us what, what were you like at that time? What did you think life was going to be before you even got into college, before you did anything else? What did you think you were put on earth to do back then? 
Yeah, that's a really great question. So I've always wanted to be an interior designer because my mom actually always loved looking at, you know, interior magazines and stuff. And so I think growing up, I was just really inspired by that. And you did end up getting a full ride to school for interior design. I did. <laughs> so congratulations. Like, Thank okay, the, so the dream is coming true, right? Yeah. You want to be an interior designer. You're in school for interior design. You graduate, you get the degree, you get the job. What happens? Yeah. So I think going on what I was mentioning, I think my mindset going into high school and university was always to have to prove myself. And so I always excelled in a lot of things like getting that full ride scholarship. My parents were super, super happy. And I went into interior design school and it actually wasn't as glamorous as I thought it would be. I also was the youngest person in my class. I was the only person that went into the program straight out of high school. And a lot of the people were a little bit older. So even just like the class itself, it was kind of hard to, you know, just like create friendships and relationships with a lot of people when they're so much older versus a lot of my friends who went to some of the more traditional universities, they were able to have like a lot of friends like within you know the first year of school because everyone was around the same age so already that kind of made me feel quote unquote like an outsider and that made me also feel like that tying to when I was in elementary school you know being the only person in my class that wasn't Catholic and then also feeling like an outsider when I was living at that home so I think my experience in university wasn't that great and then coupled with the fact that the work itself was so intense. <laughs> I think no one really talks about how intense design school is. Like we're not just writing papers and stuff. We have projects to do and there's no right or wrong answer when it comes to design. So you can be working on a design for 10 hours, or you may be working on it for a hundred hours. And I also found that when I was in school, a lot of the teachers actually weren't very supportive and they were actually very like belittling and like really like degrading to a lot of the people just in, in school in general. So I think in general, I just didn't have the best university experience, which really sucks because I still love design. And that's why I'm kind of transitioning more into, you know, brand and design now. So it's a crazy, you know, 360 moment. But I think I definitely did not have the best experience, which kind of like soured my career in interior design as well. Yeah. So let's pause right here before we get into the jobs and you starting to become known for helping side hustlers, right? Before we get there. Yeah. Um, so far, I mean, things have not been awesome, <laughs> no. right? Like so far, life seems to have a lot of downsides. Um, totally. I, I would love to know for everybody who's listening, who's been through that, right? Of seeing that, you know what? Life is just not turning out the way that I want it to. What do you say to those people who helped you get through those moments? Did you have a light at the end of the tunnel? What, were, what was your mindset at the time? It's really interesting because I feel like the fact that I was an only child, I actually never really felt that there was someone that I could talk to. Like I definitely had, you know, best friends when I was in elementary school, high school and stuff, but being an only child, I think you just really learn to be very independent with yourself, which maybe is why I like <laughs> entrepreneurship so much now, but to be quite honest, I think it was more just like my internal, just like dialogue that I've always had with myself and just like building a really strong relationship with myself and with my own mindset and being able to build that like independence and skill to be able to work through all of those things by myself, even when I was like, I don't know, 12 years old, um, that has really carried me to now. Cause I never really had anyone that I could like lean on, uh, for support. When I was talking to Debbie, and she was telling me about your program and the amazing help that you give them with actual like branding assets with things like that. Mm -hmm. I'm like, that doesn't sound like a typical business coaching program. Can you tell sure. us like briefly so that we feel closer how you went from interior design school to now owning your business with, you know, teaching branding to coaches? Yeah, that's a great question. So I 
graduated from university and I started working in the interior design field right away. The first job was absolute chaotic and hell. Um, my boss was very abusive. So I worked there for around eight months. And when I mean abusive, I mean like to everyone, she would be like throwing stuff, like throwing tantrums and stuff. Like it was ridiculous. And Mm -hmm. Right. Being that it was like my first job out of university as well. I was like, is this what corporate life is going to be? Like, that's insane. And I do not want to be a part of it. Um, And at that same time, I actually studied um, digital marketing as a certificate. And that's when I actually found like, oh, I actually really like doing digital marketing. And then I started to apply to jobs in digital marketing. And then I was able to land um, a job in digital marketing, which was really cool. And what was really interesting about that company is they did um, A-B testing and experimentation for websites. And it had like the creative kind of design stuff because there were like designers um, in the actual organization and also the strategic side of actually coming up with web strategy. And so I worked at that company for three and a half years. And while I was doing that, I was building my coaching business as a side hustle. I realized that I didn't want to do health and nutrition coaching. And what I really loved was actually doing more like helping people with the strategic side of building a business. And because I was a side hustler, I was like, oh, I might as well help other people be side hustlers too, because everyone was asking me, like, how are you so productive? Like, how are you able to create content and coach your clients and do all of these things while managing a nine to five job? And that's when I was like, okay, I guess this is my niche now. At first, it was mainly helping people with their social media and just like their online presence. And then as I started to get more clients, like paid clients, that's when I was like, oh, I can actually teach people how to sign high ticket clients as well. Um, And I left my job almost a year ago um, to go all in in my business. And since then, um, like you mentioned, I've kind of transitioned not only to doing business coaching, but really leaning more into doing brand as well. So that's like the very shortened version of <laughs> it was, yeah, and I want everybody to know, like, there's a lot in that story that we're there just is. not gonna have time to cover today. I know. <laughs> but I wanted to fast forward here because I think that what you're doing is really, really important for everybody to hear. Um, because I, I, if anybody who's listening right now has been told that they need to let go of a part of something that they really love to do uh, because it doesn't fit the business coaching model or they just, they just it just doesn't seem to fit, you got to find your own way to express yourself through your business. So I would love it if you could tell us a little bit about the branding container that you run right now mm-hmm. um, and specifically how you're able to put your knowledge, expertise, and your creativity into the program, even though it is a group program, right? Uh, It's a group program. It's not even one-on-one. And you're still able to give that kind of attention. And at which point did you make that decision? You're like, you know what? I'm just going to throw the kitchen sink into it. Tell, Tell us about how developing that idea happened. I understand this is the last time you're running and we'll get to what you're doing next. Totally. But tell us about how you developed the idea for the program. What was it supposed to be? And at mm-hmm. which point did you decide, I'm just going to give everything I got? Tell us more. Yeah. So how I started the program is this was actually the iteration, um, second iteration of an original program that I had. It was called Launch Your Hustle and it was like to launch your side hustle. And then I started to transition into actually helping people not just launch their side hustles, but actually launching their side hustles, making money from their side hustles, and then actually quitting their nine to five job. And so that was why I named the program from side hustler to entrepreneur. It's very unlikely that people would be able to quit their job in four months, once they start the container, if they've never made money before. But the idea was that they would have all the skills needed to actually do that. Um, And when I, why I decided to just throw everything in, I was like, well, if I'm going to be like my most expressed version of myself, I don't just want to be teaching you guys. I help statements and niche statements anymore. And putting together your, you know, four months, six month offers. I actually want to 
be able to just express all of me, not only online, but actually with my clients too. And that's when I started to talk more about branding with my clients. That's when I started to talk more about voice and messaging and positioning um, and growing their online presence, not just through, you know, income in their business, but so many of them have done, you know, Instagram lives with people. They've done podcast interviews with people. And that I think is definitely a byproduct of them all building their own unique brands. So tell me about your business now. So why did you choose to stop this program? Yeah, that's a good question too. So I've been doing a lot of reflection um, and very similar to what I was saying, I just got back to what I've always loved to do. And it was always to create beautiful um, and well-designed experiences for people. And I think deep down, I always kind of knew that. Um, but I think it was hard for me to kind of express that because I thought that it wouldn't make me money. Um, very similar to what you were saying, how, you know, it's so much easier to sell traditional business coaching and in a traditional way. And I definitely felt like I could have continued doing that and I made a lot of money doing that, but what is the point of building a business that makes you a lot of money, but you don't love every moment of what you're doing? Not to say that you have to love every single second of business because no one likes doing taxes. And it's all about alignment. Stuff. Yeah, totally. But at the same time, I think a lot of people believe that it's selfish to go after your desires and go after what you truly want um, in a business. And I think I had this realization that, you know, like I just fully want to be who I am and I fully want to express who I am and I fully want to sell the things that I am really passionate about because if I'm passionate about it, my clients on the other end, they're going to feel that and they're actually going to get better results on the other side. And that's why when I started to integrate the branding to the previous program, they got results. And so what I'm doing now, um, I'm actually still in the middle of like pivoting and transitioning a little bit, but I'm going to start integrating more done for you services um, into my work. So um, I'll actually be doing brand and web design for people. So you'll be able mm -hmm. to work with me. Uh, we'll work on your brand strategy, positioning, voice, um, your brand why, all of that nitty gritty stuff when it comes to your brand and then also the brand identity and design. So actually bringing your brand um, to life and then designing the website um, for you as well. And then also um, still have brand mentorship as well for people who just want to grow their online presence um, and create a brand. So this is very interesting because everybody out there, like we just said, is going to tell you, let go of the done for you services and just start scaling masterminds, group programs. You are here coming from the group program, flipping it to now done for your services. Tell us more. Who is listening right now? Who's saying, oh my God, maybe like I've just been fooling myself the entire time thinking that I have to fit myself into the small that I don't fit into. And I, what I really want to do is done for you. I want you to get us into your brain and tell us why, yeah. like why this, this is the thing that you should be doing right now. Totally. I definitely think it took a lot of kind of like self coaching for myself too, because the reality is I'm probably leaving a lot of money on the table <laughs> by transitioning into doing done for you services because people know me as a coach. I can literally just put out, you know, a group coaching offer or a one-on-one -on -one offer, and I probably would be able to fill it and have, you know, a 20, $30,000 launch. But when I think about the longevity of my business and the longevity of my life, I do not want to have evergreen programs. I do mm -hmm. not desire to be on coaching calls every single day. Um, my personality is like just, you know, at my computer focusing and just like me in my own zone. And mm -hmm. so I definitely think if you are listening to this podcast and you're like, but everyone told me that I should just be a coach. I think it's really important to ask yourself, number one, what are your desires? And number two, like, what are the values that you actually have for your life? Because you can make seven figures, but you can make seven figures and be completely miserable. Or you can make, let's say, $200,000, absolutely love every single moment of what you're doing and still be able to make a shit ton of money with it. And so I really had to think about how do I want to live my life? And this is what I'm choosing is I want to live in a life that is fully in alignment with the things that I love to do and that are fully in my desires. Now that you're going from one model to another, I'd love to hear 
the pros and cons. Let's make the lists. For oh, people. so yes. somebody is on, <laughs> on like on the edge and like, I really don't know if I should be doing done for you or coaching. So let's do some, a pro and a con, pro and con yeah. list. Let's go with coaching. What are some pros on the coaching list? For sure. So for pros, I definitely think it's a very low barrier to entry. Like anyone can just be a coach. You can just create an Instagram and just call yourself a coach one day, very low barrier to entry in terms of getting into the industry and also low barrier of entry in terms of creating a program. You can literally look at any coach and just see, oh, they have a three month program, weekly calls. Okay. That's my, that's my offer. So it's super, super simple in that way. I also think with coaching, you can start charging high ticket prices pretty early on. I think most people actually start at a minimum at like a one K two K offer. So already, you can already start making money pretty easily. And I actually think if you create really valuable content that people really resonate with, it can be very, very easy for you to sell. And you can really income stack where you can actually create a six figure business very, very simply through coaching. And then the other thing with coaching is that you're not trading time for money, right? Like you get on a coaching call with someone once a week and you have maybe Voxer chat support with them in between the calls, but that's it. It's very just like one and done kind of thing, uh, which is a little bit different from kind of done for you services. Okay. Now let's go to the con list of coaching. Yeah. So this might be like bias <laughs> for me just because I've been in the coaching industry and I'm kind of getting out of the coaching industry a little bit. I definitely think a con is a lot of people you have probably heard that it does sometimes feel like an, an MLM where coaches can just be coaches and then they coach other people to be coaches. So it's kind of that like pyramid <laughs> psychologically. So I definitely think that's a con. Um, another con of coaching, I think is business models. They all look the same and it's so easy to just copy whatever um, someone else is doing and just take it. And I also think a con with coaching is if you not necessarily saying that you have to have a certification, but I definitely think with coaching, you have to err on the side of caution that you don't go into therapy territory because sometimes people can blur the line between the two. So I think as a business owner, it's really important for you to think about that. And then also as a coach, also making sure that you're actually doing more good than harm for your clients. Cause I think that's really, really important. So let's go to the done for you services side. What mm -hmm. are some pros of the done for you services side? Yeah, for done for you, I think you can definitely kind of customize your offers a little bit more depending on the client. So for me, I personally really like that because I'm able to meet with a client and really get to know them and then create a done for you service that matches exactly what they're looking for versus with coaching. A lot of the times you have more of those like signature programs and like people do the same program. So I think for done for you, especially if you're a creative, you really get to be creative, even with the offers that you put out there. Um, I think you get to create whatever the heck you want with done for you services, whether you're a VA, social media manager, brand and web designer, I'm trying to think other like virtual assistants, so many different kind of things that you can do when it comes to done for you. So it doesn't have to just look that one um, certain way. And you also can kind of plan your client capacity. You're not working with like, you know, 10 clients at one time. Most of the time done for you service providers are maybe working with like two to five people at a time, depending on the scope of work. Let's go to our cons list. Yeah. I think the biggest con is definitely trading time for money because a lot of people do kind of charge an hourly rate. I don't actually suggest that. Um, I definitely suggest charging like project basis, but you are trading time for money because when I'm doing brand design work, I'm actually at my computer, you know, in InDesign and Illustrator, you know, doing all of those little tweaks and stuff. Um, when you're doing web design, same thing, you actually are the one who's building the wireframes and you're building the actual website and developing it, QAing it, making sure everything works. So I think that's definitely the biggest con when it comes to done for you is you're trading time for money. Um, another con I think is also, there are also a lot of different done for you service providers out there. So it's important for you to really differentiate yourself between others, because 
especially in the design world, I feel like everyone is kind of creating the same type of designs with the very neutral color palettes and the sans serif fonts and stuff, which is great. But I think it's also important to have originality. So I think that's definitely a con too, is just making sure that you're standing out. Um, oh, the other thing is it's harder to get started because if you don't have a portfolio, it's a lot harder for people to actually trust that you can help them deliver the work versus with coaching people. I don't know. People tend to trust coaches a lot more. Right. You <laughs> don't need a like, portfolio of testimonials necessarily to get started. 100%. Now you yeah. said something that is really interesting that I want to like draw out and talk a little bit more about. Yeah. You said, I don't necessarily advise that people charge hourly. Mm. Can you tell us why? Yeah. So I don't believe that you should charge hourly as a done for you service provider, because I actually think as a service provider, you should also be charging based on value like coaches do. Coaches don't tell you like, I'm charging you $100 for every call that you have, or like every time we meet, it's like $3,000. And this is how long we're meeting for every single week. And, and that's it, right? Like, that's the program. <laughs> right. Um, and I think that's kind of like the way that service providers should do too, because if you're um, doing on an hourly basis, your clients can also be very, very nitpicky with like, oh, you spend an hour doing this thing and you spend an hour doing this thing. It's kind of like when, when, um, or for lawyers, when they like have to do line by line action items of like what they spent every minute on, I personally don't feel like it's a good use of time. And I actually feel like with, um, designers and done for you service providers, you also are providing huge transformation for people and you should be pricing your packages based on value, not based on time. Yeah. Another reason that I have seen is that you actually get better and faster over time. So That's when true. you're charging a hundred dollars an hour to do a particular task. The first time you do it, it might take, you know, the full hour, but the next time it's going to take you less time. So what yeah. happens is that you end up making less money in the long run for doing exactly the same thing because you've become more efficient. And it's like, so what happened? Yeah, you, didn't charge, you didn't charge, you didn't charge for transformation. You charge literally just for your time, uh, which is just, it's just not the same. So yeah. that is really good to know. So the question is, where do you go? from here. So I've always said that, you know, if you want to grow a done for you services firm, you're going to eventually need to start to outsource some things, right? Like mm -hmm. there will be some things that you you're just not going to want to do anymore. There are just some, some things that are really, really simple to you or that maybe too mechanical, like, and I'm going to just totally come up with these off the top of my head, but you'll, you'll have your own list. It's like, yeah. um, for example, if I'm creating a website, I would probably just lay out the steps for a VA or somebody else to spin off the WordPress site, to install all my plugins, to like mm -hmm. get the website ready for me to go and start designing. So yeah. you start to expand and grow by basically creating a team of people. Is that where you see yourself going, basically creating a little agency? That's a really good question and something that I'm honestly still thinking about um, because with coaching, I feel like it's a lot easier to scale to even the seven figure mark with a very, very small team. Right. But with done for you, similar to what I was saying, you are kind of trading time for money sometimes. And sometimes it does require more manpower for you to be able to scale to the seven figures. I think with the lifestyle that I am really envisioning for myself, I don't see myself having like a 10, 20 person team, maybe like a two to three person team. And I personally, I'm completely okay at me being at like the multiple six figure mark and maybe never getting to the seven figure mark, even though I know that's like the dream for so many people. But I think it's just personal preference. Some people love to continue to scale their businesses to seven, multiple seven, even um, eight figures. But some people want to build more of a lifestyle business where they're able to, you know, pay for two, three, two to three full-time employees, treat them super, super well, and still have enough money to have the lifestyle that they want and still be able to make impact just in different ways. So I don't think that making more money necessarily is the only kind of like indicator of the impact that you can make. I think you can have a multiple six figure business and still make impact just in different ways. So Tiff, <laughs> what do you think is one of the biggest misconceptions that people have of you as a successful businesswoman? I think people believe that I'm very bubbly all the time. 
um, because that genuinely like is my personality. Like if you go on my stories, if you like, if you ever meet me in person, like this is kind of how I am. Like, it's just my personality and how I like to express myself. But there are definitely days when I'm not like this. Like even this morning, I did not want to get out of bed. I was like, I just kind of want to lay in bed all day, but I know I have to get stuff done today. So I kind of have to get myself um, up. And so I think that's a big misconception is people believe I'm always this like bubbly, like fireball of energy all of the time. And that's not the case at all. Most of the time when I shut down my computer and I don't look at my phone after my workday, I'm like, in my like onesie, just like eating like potato chips and like ice cream and just like (laughs) cuddled up with my dog. Like I am not like this all of the time. If everybody who's listening had to do what you're about to tell them to do, and they have to do it in the next 24 hours, what Mm -hmm. would that thing be? I would say whatever social media platform is your social media platform of choice, create something or talk about something that is fully you and a full expression of you and a fully unfiltered version of yourself. Love it. That's what I I would say. (laughs) What would that look look like? I love that. So Tiff, it has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for being so generous with showing us what's going on on the fly, right? In your business right now. I've really appreciated this completely genuine and authentic and open conversation about business. Um, I know that it helps a ton of people out there. So how can everybody find you, follow you and see what's happening next in your business? Yeah, for sure. So I mainly hang out on Instagram. So you can find me at it's Tiff Chang. Um, You can also find me on my website. It's tiffchang.com, which has all of the different ways that you can work with me, coaching, done for you services. Um, And I also have a podcast called Become an Entrepreneur as well. And we were going to put all all those links in the show notes for everybody to see. Tiff Chang, thank you so much for coming on the Global Phenomenon. You're awesome. Thank you so much for having me. 